Please be seated. Good evening. I am Stephen Friedman, Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer of Fordham University. I will serve as the Master of Ceremonies for tonight's event. To all gathered with us on this historic night at Fordham University, especially our distinguished and revered guest, His All Holiness Bartholomew, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch. <laughs> to your eminences, your excellencies, and your graces, and distinguished clergy, and to all our many honored guests and friends, we extend a warm and cordial welcome to each and every one of you. On behalf of the chair of Fordham University's Board of Trustees and all of our trustees, our own father president, our faculty, administrators, and students, his Excellency, Archbishop Timothy M. Dolan, Archbishop of New York, will give the invocation. Will all please rise. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to you, dear God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We glorify you for your one holy Catholic and apostolic church so visibly and beautifully obvious to us this holy evening as we gather in the presence of his All Holiness Bartholomew, the Archbishop of Constantinople and Ecumenical Patriarch. We bless your holy name for this university founded for your greater honor and glory dedicated to your Son, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for the religious freedom we cherish in this beloved United States of America, for the interreligious amity and respect that characterize this greater New York community, and for the faith and friendship that so gloriously binds us this evening. We entrust to you our needs, our dreams, our hopes and our efforts, confident as always in the help of your Holy Mother Mary, as we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the president of Fordham University, Reverend Joseph M. McShane of the Society of Jesus. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Your All Holiness, in the name of Christ our Savior, I welcome you to the University Church, this historic house of prayer that has stood at the center of the University's campus and mission since it was built by our founder, Archbishop John Hughes, in 1844. Your All Holiness, your eminences, your graces, and your excellencies, on behalf of the entire Fordham family, it is a great honor Indeed, it is a great grace to welcome you to the university this afternoon. Is it, it is, of course, a particular grace to welcome you, Your All Holiness, both to Rose Hill and to the Fordham family, your second Jesuit family. 
Your presence and the presence of so many of our beloved brothers in the Orthodox Episcopate, both here in America and throughout the world, is a source of great joy to the whole Fordham community. I hope you do not mind if I say that I am especially happy to welcome my dear friend, Archbishop Demetrius, back to Fordham, his second home this afternoon. At the same time, I am deeply grateful for the presence of their eminences, Cardinals Egan, whom His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI has appointed as his delegate to our ceremony, Cardinal Keeler, the Archbishop Emeritus of Baltimore, and Cardinal McCarrick, the Archbishop Emeritus of Washington, as well as their excellencies, Archbishop Dolan, the Archbishop of New York, and Migliore, the Papal Nuncio and Permanent Observer to the United Nations, to our gathering this evening. Their presence indicates the great affection and the deep reverence that the Roman Catholic Church, both in the United States and throughout the world, has for you, Your All Holiness. For my part, I must tell you that Your Grace presence on our campus this evening reminds me of the long and affectionate ties that have bound the University and the Orthodox Churches together for so long. For years, Fordham was blessed by the presence of Father John Meyendorf on our faculty. And for generations, the sons and daughters of Orthodox families have come to Fordham to pursue their college degrees. In the process, they have enriched the life of the university beyond measure. With the seriousness with, with, with which they have approached their studies, with the devotion that they have always had for the university and its mission, and with their prayer. As you know, thanks in large part to the support that we have received both from you and from Archbishop Demetrius, in the last few years the university's relationship to and service of the Orthodox community in America has grown even stronger. Indeed, as a result of the Archbishop's assistance, Fordham has been able to establish a program in Orthodox studies that is unique in the United States, a program that provides Orthodox students with both the pastoral care of a chaplain and the opportunity to complete a course of studies in Orthodox theology. On this night so filled with hope and so rich in meaning, I would like to tell you how grateful we at Fordham are for the grace-filled love that you have shown our efforts and for the generosity of spirit that the Orthodox Church has always shown Fordham. Of course, Fordham does not merely honor you this evening for the support that you have given to our efforts to nurture the faith on our campus. Far from it. Your All Holiness, we honor you for the extraordinary service that you have given to the Orthodox Church, the whole Christian family, and to the world and your service has been extraordinary indeed. Your All Holiness, throughout your ministry as the Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and the Ecumenical Patriarch, as the successor of the Apostle Andrew, you have discharged the duties of your office with vision and with holiness. In the model of your saintly predecessor, St. John Chrysostom, you have been a theologian of rare wisdom and wide erudition. Axios. In the, in the model of the patriarch Athenagoras I, you have devoted yourself to the work of ecumenical dialogue with loving compassion. Axios. And in the model of the Lord, whom you have sought to serve with every fiber of your being, you have embraced the whole world. Indeed, you have made the whole world your parish and you have enriched the world with your devotion to peace and the cause of environmentalism. Axios. You have therefore been a threefold blessing to the world and to the church. Therefore you are thrice worthy of the honor that you receive this evening. And we at Fordham make our own the greeting with which the Orthodox faithful welcome you throughout the world. Axios, Axios, Axios. May the great shepherd of the flock, Christ Jesus our Lord, sustain you on your ministry and continue to make you a blessing to all who meet you and all who benefit from your wisdom, your service, and your love. 
And again I say, Axios, Axios, Axios. I now have the honor to present to you His Eminence, Edward Cardinal Egan, who has been designated the Papal Delegate by His Holiness Benedict XVI. Your All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, it is for me a distinct honor and a pleasure to welcome you in the name of our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI. I count this an extraordinary honor, and I assure you that the welcome is from the heart. Today at luncheon, Your All Holiness, you told me of a visit of Pope Benedict XVI to Constantinople to see you in the year 2006. And you very kindly gave me a wonderful memento of that event. And you mentioned that this was a great step toward understanding and unity among the followers of Jesus Christ. My prayer this evening your All Holiness, is that tonight will be another step, oh, perhaps not such a giant step, but an important step as well. Here at Fordham, you see so many who look to you for leadership and inspiration. Here at Fordham, you see so many who join with you in praying to the Lord for peace and understanding across the world. Here with you, you find the brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, which you have invited us all to be in your ever, ever beautiful visits across the world. Again, I say, welcome. And I say welcome in the name of the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI. Let me also say welcome in the name of the Catholic community, the community of faith that is the Archdiocese of New York. As you may know, the authentic leader of the Archdiocese is here tonight, and he is my boss and I'll try not to make any mistakes. <laughs> but we are, in the Archdiocese, immensely proud of Fordham University. I've had the great blessing of having had so much of my education from the Jesuit Fathers. And my esteem for them and this institution knows no limit. Just as you were visited by the Holy Father in 2006, you are visiting us in 2009. And we assure you that the visit is one of love and, again, one that will lead us to becoming one in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Archdiocese of New York welcomes you. May your stay with us be a source of encouragement, a source of deeper understanding, and an opportunity for us to say to you and to all the Orthodox community what Jesus Christ said to his apostles. We must be one. Thank you for your leadership in seeing to it that that call of the Savior 
be fulfilled. God love you and welcome you. Reverend Robert Grimes of the Society of Jesus and Dean of Fordham College at Lincoln Center will now present our honorary degree candidate. Reverend Father President, I present to you His All Holiness Bartholomew, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and the Ecumenical Patriarch to be awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. War in the name of religion is war against religion. His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. Since his enthronement in 1991, His All Holiness Bartholomew, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch, has been an apostle of peace. Not the peace of the earthly city, which, as St. Augustine made clear, was simply a temporary sensation, cessation of violence, but the peace of which Christ spoke when he assured his disciples, peace I leave with you my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. This peace is the communion that Christ shares with God through the Father. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, it becomes possible for all of God's creation to share in the peace of divine human communion. As a missionary of the peace of Christ, his All Holiness carries forward the apostolic legacy of his renowned predecessors, St. Andrew, the first called apostle, St. Gregory, the theologian, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Photius the Great, who commenced the conversion of the Slavic people. His All Holiness tireless efforts to repair the brokenness of creation caused by human avarice have earned him the beloved epithet the Green Patriarch. He has constantly proclaimed to the global community the sacramental potential of all creation, that the Holy Spirit, as the Orthodox Prayer of Pentecost states, is everywhere present and fills all things. God is present in creation. But the beauty of the divine glory is only experienced when hum humans relate to their fellow creatures in a Eucharistic spirit. His All Holiness has embodied this presence to the world, both as minister of the Eucharist, in which his authority as first among equals throughout Orthodox Christianity is most visible, and through his tireless efforts to protect the waters of the world by organizing environmental symposia regarding the Black Sea, the Danube River, the Baltic and Adriatic Seas, and most recently, the Mississippi River. As spiritual leader of more than 300 million Orthodox Christians throughout the world, the Ecumenical Patriarch has worked in close and brotherly association with Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. These three Holy Fathers have recognized that the Christian mission to be an image of divine human communion and an apostle of peace to the world is hindered by the schism between the sister churches. The Ecumenical Patriarch has welcomed Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI to the Ecumenical Patriarch and has visited the Vatican on numerous occasions, signaling his commitment to the reconciliation of the two churches through a dialogue of truth and love. As a Christian leader in a non-Christian country, His All Holiness has championed human rights especially the right to religious freedom and economic equality. He has initiated peace and reconciliation efforts throughout the world. He has visited Muslim countries and met with their leaders. He has visited Israel and met with the World Jewish Congress. 
the ecumenical patriarch spearheaded the Bern and Bosphorus declarations condemning violence in the name of religion, both in word and in deed. The ministry of His All Holiness is truly ecumenical, bringing the peace of Christ to the far corners of the earth. For his remarkable service to the world community and for the principles that he continues to uphold, we, the President and Trustees of Fordham University, in solemn convocation assembled and in accord with the chartered authority bestowed upon us by the Regents of the University of the State of New York, declare His All Holiness Bartholomew, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch, Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa, that he might enjoy all the rights and privileges of this, our highest honor. We have issued these letters patent under our hand and under the corporate seal of the university on this, the 27th day of October, in the year of our Lord, 2009. At this time, I would like you to join me in welcoming the Fordham University Choir. The choir will sing a traditional Orthodox hymn in honor of the Ecumenical Patriarch, wishing him many, many more years of continued ministry. His All Holiness will then provide his address.
I will take this, so you don't have to worry. Your Eminences, Most Learned President, Father Joseph McShane, esteemed members of the Board of Trustees and beloved brothers of the Society of Jesus, Exochotati Kiri Presbys, most learned professors and students, distinguished guests, beloved children and people of God. It is with sincere gratitude that we accept this invaluable honor of being received into the doctoral college of this esteemed Jesuit school. We welcome this privilege as a recognition of the sacred ministry of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, an apostolic institution with a history spanning 17 centuries throughout retaining its see in Constantinople. Yet our church is no worldly institution. It wields no political authority. Instead, it leads by example, coordinating pan-Orthodox Christian unity by virtue of a primacy of love and honor, a ministry emanating from its supranational authority. This universal consciousness gave rise to the first seven ecumenical councils, articulated the symbol of faith or Nicene Creed, and established the New Testament canon. It also gave birth to churches from the Caspian to the Baltic and from the Balkans to Central Europe. Today, its jurisdiction extends to the Far East, Western Europe, Australia, and America. Of course, this ecumenicity constitutes both an ancient privilege and a lasting responsibility demanding an open ministry within our own communities, communions, among other Christian confessions, as well as toward the world's faith communities. Within our ecumenical initiatives, the international theological dialogue with our sister Church of Rome, instituted in the 60s, as the dialogue of love and continuing today as the dialogue of truth comprises our foremost encounter of speaking the truth in love, caritas in veritate, as it is the title of the recent encyclica of His Holiness the Pope. A, con a concrete example of this encounter here at Fordham is the Orthodox Christian Minor Studies Program, which is the first of its kind at a major university in the United States, as it is already said. This program complements the existing annual Orthodoxy in America lecture and the Orthodox Christian Fellowship and demonstrates a practical synergistic spirit modeling for Orthodox and Roman Catholics everywhere, a shared common purpose based in truth and in love. Nevertheless, our purpose this evening is not to outline for you to the manner in which the ecumenical imperative defines our church, but rather to inspire in all of you the primacy of ecumenicity or the value of opening up in a world that expects us always to be prepared 
to give an answer to everyone that asks us to give the reason for the hope within us. Didone logon pandito etundi peritis enimin elpidos. In this regard, we would like to draw your attention to three dimensions of opening up or ecumenical consciousness. One, opening up to the heart. Two, opening up to the other. And three, opening up to creation. Opening up to the heart, the way of the spirit. As faith communities and as religious leaders, it is our obligation constantly to pursue and persistently to proclaim alternative ways to order human affairs, ways that reject violence and reach for peace. Human conflict may well be inevitable in our world, but war certainly is not. If the 21st century will be remembered at all, it may be for those who dedicated themselves to the cause of tolerance and understanding. Yet, the pursuit of peace calls for a reversal of what has become normal and normative in our world. It requires conversion, metania, or metanoia, and the willingness to become individuals and communities of transformation. The Orthodox Christian spiritual classics emphasize the heart as the place where God, humanity, and world may coincide in harmony. Indeed, the Philokalia underlines the paradox that peace is gained through witness, through martyria, perceived not as passivity or indifference to human suffering, but as relinquishing selfish desires and acquiring greater generosity. The way of the heart stands in opposition to everything that violates peace. When one awakens to the way within, peace flows as an expression of gratitude for God's love for the world. Unless our actions are founded on love rather than on fear, they will never overcome fanaticism and fundamentalism. In this sense, the way of the heart is a radical response, threatening policies of violence and politics of power. This is why peacemakers threatened the status quo. Indeed, the Sermon on the Mount, the Epituorus Omilia to Kiriu, shaped the pacifist teaching of Leo Tolstoy whose work, The Kingdom of God is Within You, was molded by the writings of the Philokalia and, in turn, profoundly influenced both the non-violent principles of Mahatma Gandhi and the civil rights activism of Martin Luther King. Sometimes the most provocative message is loving our enemy and doing good to those who hate us. Some may announce the end of faith or the end of history, blaming religion for violent aberrations in human behavior, yet never goes the peaceful protest of religion more necessary than now. Never was the powerful resistance of religion more critical than today. Ours is the beginning, not the end of either faith or history. Two, opening up to the other, the way of dialogue. This is why the interreligious gatherings 
initiated by the Ecumenical Patriarchate are crucial for paving the way toward peaceful coexistence between the world's peoples. Such dialogue draws people of diverse religious beliefs and cultural, cultural traditions out of their isolation, instituting a process of mutual respect and meaningful communication. When we seek this kind of encounter, we discover ways of coexisting despite our differences. After all, historical conflicts between Christians and Muslims are normally rooted in politics and not in religion. The tragic story of the Crusades is a telling example. Bequeathing a legacy of cultural alienation and ethnic resentment. Speaking then of an inevitable and inexorable clash of civilizations is incorrect and inappropriate, especially when such a theory posits religion as the principal battleground on which such conflict is doomed to occur. National leaders may provoke isolation and aggression between Christians and Muslims, or else demagogues may mobilize religions in order to reinforce national fanaticism and hostility. However, this is not to be confused with the true nature and purpose of religion. Christian and Muslims lived alongside each other during the Byzantine and the Ottoman empires, usually supported by their political and religious authorities. In Andalusia, Spain, believers in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam coexisted peacefully for centuries. Such historical models reveal possibilities for our own pluralistic and globalized world. Moreover, any theory about the clash of civilizations is invariably naive inasmuch as it oversimplifies differences between peoples, cultures, and religions. How ironic that religi religion promotes a more liberal position than the realism of a political scientist. The visit in November 2006 on the occasion of our patron's feast, the feast of St. Andrew, by Pope Benedict XVI, our elder and beloved brother, to the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople, Istanbul, was historical not only for relations between the Eastern and Western churches, but also for Christianity and Islam. The then newly elected Pope continued a tradition established by his predecessors, the late Popes Paul VI and John Paul II, who both visited the Fanar in 1967 and 1979, respectively, requiescant both in pace. We affectionately recall how Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras, an extraordinary leader of profound vision and ecumenical sensitivity, a tall man with piercing eyes, would resolve conflict by inviting the embattled parties to meet, saying to them, come, let us look one another in the eyes. This means that we must listen more carefully, look one another more deeply 
in the eyes. As Sir Nilus of Ansira wrote, or Agios Nilos Angiras, you are a world within the world. Look inside yourself and there you will see God in the whole of creation. Each of us comprises a living icon of the divine creator, and we are furthermore always, whether we know it or not, closer to one another in more ways than we are distant from one another, closer than we might ever suspect or even imagine. And the last point, opening up to creation, the way of the earth. Speaking of icons, when it comes to God and creation, leads us to our final point. For nowhere is the sense of openness more apparent, apparent than in the beauty of orthodox iconography and the wonder of God's creation. In affirming sacred images, the Seventh Ecumenical Council in Nicaea, 787, was not primarily concerned with religious art, but with the presence of God in the heart, in others, and in creation. For icons encourage us to seek the extraordinary in the ordinary, to be filled with the same wonder of the Genesis account when God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Kala lian. The Greek word for goodness is kalos which implies both etymologically and symbolically a sense of calling. Icons are invitations to rise beyond uh, tri trivial concerns and menial reductions. We must ask ourselves, do we see beauty in others and in our world? The truth is that we refuse to behold God's word in the oceans of our planet, in the trees of our continents, and in the animals of our earth. In so doing, we deny our own nature, which demands that we stop low enough to hear God's word in creation. We fail to perceive created nature as the extended body of Christ. Eastern Christian theologians always emphasized the cosmic proportions of divine incarnation. For them, the entire world is a prologue to St. John's Gospel. And when the Church overlooks the broader cosmic dimensions of God's world, it neglects its mission to implore God for the transformation of the whole polluted cosmos. On Easter Sunday, Orthodox Christians chant, Now everything is filled with divine light, heaven and earth and all things beneath the earth. So let all creation rejoice. Nin panda peplirote fotos, uranoste ke yi και τα καταχθόνια εορταζέ το γουν πάσα κτήσεις. The principal reason for our visit to the United States, dear brothers and sisters, this month, was our hosting of an environmental symposium, the 8th one, along the Mississippi River focusing on its impact on New Orleans. This journey was also a personal pilgrimage after our original visit to New Orleans soon after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. 
The symposium goes the eighth, as I said, in a series of international, interfaith, and interdisciplinary conferences, which gather scientists and theologians, politicians and journalists in an effort to raise awareness on regional ecological issues that have a global impact on our world. After all, we are convinced that recalling our minuteness in God's white and wonderful creation only underlines our central role in God's plan for the salvation of the whole world. Opening up to the heart, opening up, up to the other, and opening up to creation. Our age demands no less than openness from all of us. We hear it stated often that our world is in crisis, yet never before in history have human beings had the opportunity to bring so many positive changes to so many people simply through encounter and through dialogue. The interaction of human beings and ethnic groups is today direct and immediate as a result of technological advances in the mass media and means of travel. While it may be true that this is a time of crisis, it must equal, equally be underlined that there has also never been greater tolerance for respective traditions, religious preferences, and cultural peculiarities. The human heart, the other person, and the natural creation each comprise profound icons of the living God. May you always remain open to the heart, open to others, and open to creation. This is the only way to discern the presence of God in our world. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Your All Holiness. We look deep inside your eyes and we see love and we see God. His Eminence, Archbishop Dimitrios, Primate of the Greek Orthodox Church in America, will now offer the benediction. Please rise. Almighty and merciful God, to you belong glory and power and praise and might and blessing for giving us this evening, an evening in which we were able to truly celebrate the beautiful event of a human achievement which constitutes an honor for us as humans.
and for you as a creator. We thank you for giving to us as leader of the Greek Orthodox Church and the Ecumenical Church, His Old Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew, a living example of the power and the beauty of the gospel. We ask you to keep this patriarch in health for many years, covered with your wisdom, your prudence, your love, and your salvific action for the whole world. We ask you to keep him as a alive and shining example, to be what St. Paul said when he projected the leaders of the church as models to be followed. We ask you to give your blessings to the venerable hierarchs and clergy that are present here tonight in this noble and magnificent university. We ask you to bless abundantly your servant, Father Joseph McShane, the very creative and dynamic and very dedicated president of this university, as well as the trustees, faculty, students, personnel, and benefactors of this university. We ask you to keep this university and all the institutions that carry the faith and the gospel, to keep all of them as centers of real knowledge, deep wisdom, prudence, and places which provide to their students the real ways of becoming agents of edification and improvement of our world. And we ask you, merciful Lord, to look with mercy to our wounded world, to our society that suffers, to the millions of people who are looking for help and assistance, and shower them with your benevolent rain or sunshine. And we ask you to also look with your grace and your care to our wounded natural environment. Please, Lord, purify the waters, clean the air we breathe, give to the vegetation and the animal world the possibility to really be your creatures on this planet, and give to all of us the very beautiful open horizons of a hope that is not dying under any circumstances because it is founded in you, the rock of faith. We ask all of them with the certainty that they will be given in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit the Holy Trinity to whom all glory and praise and blessings belong now and to the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you all for coming this evening. I now invite all of you to join us for a reception in the student lounge on the second floor of the McGinley Center.
Enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>